Wonderful. Well, we're about 37 people right now, so we're going to get started and hope that more come in as we as we go. I'm Maureen Aylward, the Executive Director of Town Green. Welcome so much to this first uh, in, the, in the Climate Science Speaker Series that Town Green is launching this year. Um, and to kick it off, we have Chris Gloninger uh, from uh, the Woods Hole Group. He's a senior climate scientist there. Um, and he's going to tell us about a warming world, climate change impacts on New England winters. Chris, welcome. Thanks for having more, uh, me, Maureen, and uh, thanks for the invite. And thanks for all of you that are taking the time uh, to learn a little bit about the issue. And I know uh, talking with Maureen, she said this is a well-educated uh, when it comes to climate science uh, group. So I'm excited to engage and, and leave plenty of time for a conversation a little bit later on. So I'm going to share my screen so we can go through um, and get started with the presentation. <clears throat> Let me go into presentation mode. So as Maureen uh, mentioned, as people are just signing on, I see the numbers are still going up. I am a climate scientist at Woods Hole Group, which uh, branched off of Huey Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute back in the 1980s. A couple of scientists started an environmental consulting firm. And we do a lot of uh, resilience planning, helping communities adapt and mitigate the impacts of climate change. But this is a relatively new point in my career because the last 18 years, 18 plus years, I was a TV meteorologist and I found this need in the climate space for effective communicators and nothing against my colleagues that are engineers. Uh, but I've seen this need for uh, ways to approach um, tactfully and communicate uh, what some of these resilience projects look like going forward and helping get the community engaged in a way that's not alienating. And we help people and engage with people that may not be as literate when it comes to climate change. Um, so uh, a few stops. Some of you, if you watched NBC Boston, uh, I was part of the launch of NBC Boston. Uh, back in 2016, when WHDH uh, moved on with their affiliate with uh, affiliation with NBC, and then uh, NBC NBC uh, opened up an their own owned and operated station uh, in in Boston, which was an exciting opportunity. And it was really there I grew my passion for covering climate change. I was the weekend evening meteorologist, and then during the week, I started a climate franchise, and that is a recurring series uh, on a certain topic. That's what we call that in the news industry. And it took a little bit of convincing, but uh, I had the support of my management, and it was after covering uh, multiple hurricanes between 2016 and 2018 that I said, we have to be doing more. We have to be doing more uh, storytelling on the issue. And there was some skepticism at first about would we have enough to sustain a series? Quickly, we found it would be overwhelming. Uh, there was so much content, and especially in an educational hub like Boston with so much research going on, and then such a vulnerable part of the population when it comes to sea level rise. And then I went to Des Moines, Iowa, which in TV would be downsizing and market size, going from a top 10 market uh, like Boston is, it's market number eight, but I was chief meteorologist and it was an interesting opportunity in that they wanted me to cover climate change in a part of the country where there was this void. And like uh, the fishing industry, for example, uh, and the East Coast that has changed noticeably because of climate change, agriculture is a huge part of this economy. So it just made sense to have somebody educating uh, the audience on the impacts of climate change, where agriculture was such a huge vital part of that uh, economy. And just a quick little side note on this, it, you may have read the headlines and you may have heard uh, my name when Maureen announced that I was coming to speak. Uh, I received a death threat for that coverage uh, while I was out there. And unfortunately, I, I found the perfect formula to talk about climate change there because it was an area that wind energy uh, was the primary source of, of 
energy in the state and one of the largest wind producers in the entire country in the top three. We went from a house uh, in Norwood, Massachusetts to a house in Des Moines, West Des Moines in particular, uh, to be more precise. And uh, the house is double the size. The utility bill was half the cost. And I said, you know, this is true energy independence. When you're harvesting and growing this energy in your backyard and those turbines ended up being ten dollars to $15,000 uh, chunks of, of cash for farmers, and that could offset, uh, offset a bad season. So for every turbine, they were getting these large sums of money for land leases. And that's true energy independence, which is oftentimes a cur uh, conservative term. And we just used it, or I used it in a way that could kind of reach across the aisle and get uh, a part of the population that really wasn't engaged in climate change, interested about the topic. And then we hit a record number of billion dollar disasters. Uh, and this year we set a new record for billion dollar disasters. And I used the term fiscally responsible. And I said it was fiscally irresponsible to allow all of these natural disasters to happen unchecked and write out empty checks or a blank checks for recovery costs. Uh, for every dollar spent on mitigation and adaptation, we end up saving $7 on the back end of recovery costs. So allowing communities to just rebuild after storm after storm after storm is fiscally irresponsible. So these investments were responsible. So using their terminology was an effective way I used to communicate the climate science to a part of the country that skewed uh, more conservative, especially after 2016. But uh, for a, a number of reasons, including lack of management support on continuing my efforts to talk about climate change, we decided to move back and I got into the, the world of environmental consulting uh, and helping the scientists on my team communicate those impacts of climate change. So I mentioned the, my coverage and getting into the industry was told absolutely not, you couldn't cover it. And then I was told you need both sides. And in journalism, that's called a false balance. When there's evidence of one, but not of the other. So, and there's no evidence that it's a natural cycle. There's no evidence that it's uh, due to the solar cycle every 11 years. Um, so that false balance uh, was quite clear early on in my career. Uh, but then there was just always something more important to talk about. And photographers, when I was planning on covering these stories, were pulled to cover breaking news because we, of course, need to know about every crash, fire, and shooting. Um, but we couldn't cover the one issue that affects everybody, unfortunately. And then that's when, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I, I approached station management after covering Hurricane Harvey with over 50 inches of rain and Irma and Dorian that rapidly intensified to category five status in just a short amount of time. This was our new normal, we needed to do more. And I helped launch the country's first weekly series on climate change, which was right here in the Boston uh, viewing area, which was fantastic. And then I went on to help um, the Hearst television group start their forecasting our future series. And then again, my time was cut short after a, a death threat, lack of management support, which I couldn't be as vocal about as I wanted to be. Unfortunately, they told me to, to curb that. And, uh, and I thought it was best if we moved our, our separate ways from that point forward. <clears throat> again, I know a lot of this may be knowledge you already have, but for those of you that are joining that uh, you're new to this, uh, we can see the relationship right here, and there's nothing more effective than showing our CO2 emissions since essentially the Industrial Revolution and our atmospheric global temperatures, that average temperature over time. And the two are married on this graphic. They follow each other exactly. You may say, well, look, you see the temperature fluctuates. Well, that's because of global natural cycles like El Nino and La Nina, and the, uh, the Atlantic Oscillation, which is another big global uh, pattern. So that would be the natural cycle that we would expect to see. Those would be the, the, the cycles uh, that are natural versus what is man-made, the anthropogenic side of it, which is our CO2 emissions over time. And this, this graphic, I'll, I'll start playing this, is quite telling. And uh, we're often asked as climate scientists and meteorologists, well, how do you know what happened so long ago? And that really is a great question. And if, if somebody really is wanting to learn and willing to listen, uh, you can uncover a lot of data from hundreds of thousands of years ago in the 
case of ice cores, for example, ice cores, we can actually have uh, up to a million years of data. And same goes for ocean sediment. As they uh, take out these large cores, they shoot a laser beam through that, and they can get an idea of what the atmospheric composition was at that time. And that can allow us to help uh, paint a picture of what those atmospheric conditions were like then. Uh, so as this graphic starts to finish up, you can kind of see the trend perfectly of how 100 years ago, it was relatively stable, the climate. But then as we introduced more and more and more and more CO2 into the atmosphere, you start to see all of those reds concentrated at the top where, uh, where again, that's uh, we're seeing that warming trend. Um, so as we move on, and this is really the, the meat of the talk and, and, and what Maureen asked me to do after I wrote a, uh, a perspective column in the, in the Globe, is what is happening to our winters? And it's very fitting for the weather that we're having this week, not just locally, but nationally. Um, with our warmer planet, we hold more moisture. And for a long time, when we were using this statistic, it was perhaps hard to follow and process and visualize. But now we're seeing it in these amounts of rain that are devastating, uh, not just out west in California, we're seeing atmospheric rivers, but what we saw across parts of the Merrimack Valley a couple of times over the course of the last year. And so every one degree of warming that we see in Fahrenheit, it holds 4% more moisture. So that's what it looks like. That is the change that we are, are seeing. And for some, that may mean more snow because even if the average temperature warmed from 25 degrees to 31 degrees, that's still below the freezing mark. So we're seeing a temporary uptick in snow accumulation. And that doesn't contradict everything we're saying about climate change and global warming. That is just uh, one of the signs that the atmosphere is holding more moisture. And you don't have to look back too far to see that record-breaking season in 2015 where Boston picked up over 100 inches of snow, amounts of snow that you would typically see in maybe the lake effect zones across the Great Lakes. <clears throat> uh, so that's this is what I was kind of mentioning. If you look at that coastal plain, including Cape Ann, including Boston, the Cape, and down towards southern New England, we've actually seen more snow over time. Uh, and then there have been significant decreases in the mountainous areas and the areas that need snow. And we'll talk a little bit about the impact that this is having on our economy, but it really holds true for places not too far away in the whites and the greens and the Berkshires and the Catskills and the Adirondacks with a shortened ski season. And the ski hills in Massachusetts are really suffering because we can't even get enough cold to produce snow, which is uh, again, heartbreaking, uh, but only 36% of the stations that were surveyed in this research showed an uptick in overall snowfall. And then you can see the areas that are seeing less cold, so that winter chill that has actually been decreasing over time. And we have a neutralizing effect uh, with the ocean uh, because oceans hold on to their heat content a lot longer. Water holds on to heat. It's harder to heat, but it retains the heat for a lot longer. And that stabilizes the environment a little bit, uh, whereas inland locations are really seeing that significant warm up where uh, the temperatures that are below average, we're seeing 25 less of those days. And what does that mean? What does that mean when there's less cold? And I've been very critical now that I've been out of the business and, and you know, I'm not trying to make friends in the process, but I've called out former colleagues and peers that have been celebrating and getting excited and giddy over these record-breaking temperatures. And I said, it's one thing if you're celebrating temperatures that are in the 50s and low 60s within the statistical norm, like a February thaw or a January thaw, like we've seen for uh, centuries. But this is so far outside of that normal. And that is what is, uh, as, as, as a climate and atmospheric scientist, terrifying. Uh, we, were rec we were breaking records for the entire month, not a record high temperature for the day. These are records for the month. 
And then when I uh, when I mentioned that, the pushback I received was, well, there were temperatures back in the 1930s during the Dust Bowl era. But the climate piece of this is, it's part of a bigger issue. The fact that so many locations in New England, the Great Lakes and the Midwest have seen a top 10 warmest winter on record. And that's where it really becomes a major concern. Uh, and for us that live right near the water, Cape Ann, I'm on Cape Cod. Um, I had this presentation ready to go, but uh, just today we're starting to see another uptick. And this is alarming. The ocean water temperature anomaly that we're seeing is a one in 216,000 year event, which is mind boggling. That is such a hard statistic to process when you think about it, that scientists that are researching this, this is not my area of expertise, I know enough about it to present on it, but those scientists, those ocean uh, scientists that study the dynamics uh, over time uh, say that, that this truly is one of those concerning alarm bells that we're seeing right now. And it's above last year's temperature average, which was a record setting year. And we're outpacing that by a wide margin. The orange line that you see was last year. The dark black line is this year's temperature profile so far. And it's way above where we were this time last year, which is extremely concerning. <clears throat> so the impacts, what, what do these warmer winters mean for our, uh, our ocean uh, climate and, and uh, you know, in turn, uh, the, the industry that we have when it comes to fishing? Uh, for aquaculture, it's devastating. Uh, we have a cod and lobster that are now migrating farther north to find colder water. And places like Nova Scotia and now Newfoundland are seeing a boom in the lobster industry. Uh, but for many uh, fishing communities, they're having to shutter or switch over to a combination of running charters to get creative, to get creative and supplement some of those income losses. Um, and also, uh, warming ocean waters, people assume that all of our rising sea level occurs because of melting land ice, what's happening in Greenland, what's happening with the glaciers in Antarctica. While that plays an important role, thermal expansion applies to warmer ocean waters. So to take you back to the classroom, if you might have forgotten that term, when water warms, it expands. So this rising sea level is happening for two reasons. The glaciers are melting, but we're also seeing ex thermal expansion. So that water is actually expanding in its footprint and causing it to rise. Um, what we're also noticing is that we get into these patterns um, during the winter where the jet stream becomes wavy. And Dr. Jennifer Francis, who works for Woodwell Climate Research Center, uh, published only a couple of years ago, it's called weather whiplash, which is a great terminology. And having been in news, that is something that the news industry uh, absolutely loves. Uh, but it's also something that um, is concerning when it comes to being in these active patterns that don't break down. So when the cold migrates south from the North Pole, the jet stream begins to get wavy and we get stuck into patterns. The weather goes from one extreme to another. So it may be very, very cold, but it's usually followed by record warmth. And th that fits the pattern for what we saw from December through January, that one month stretch that happened just before the Christmas holiday through the first half of September, uh, for the first half of January, where we had those sou'easters, which weren't as impactful. I know you had flooding in Cape Ann, but this was more of an impactful event or setup for uh, places that are, are south facing beaches. So the Cape, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, uh, places like uh, southern parts of Rhode Island. Uh, and we're seeing these patterns join up with atmospheric rivers, which are uh, atmospheric uh, channels of water, which hold almost 27 times the amount of water that's flowing through the Mississippi River. And those atmospheric rivers cause stronger storms. And that strong, those stronger storms are caused by 
uh, and aided by warmer ocean water temperatures. So these storms are in, getting injected with even more moisture than they had uh, several decades ago. And what's, what's remarkable is I, you can see this weather whiplash perfectly in seeing um, our fluctuations between a ton of moisture and extremely dry weather. So meteorological seasons run from the first of the month, the last day of the month. So meteorological winter runs from December 1st to the end of February. And those are climatologically the coldest three months out of the year, as opposed to uh, using the equinox and uh, the, the, uh, the, the solstice. We use this for climatological records and it's a lot easier to use those. So if you look at December and January, we will likely see a top 10 wettest winter on record, and yet we will likely see a top 10 driest February on record. So that really puts a spotlight on these large swings that we're seeing across the area, that we can still maintain a top 10 ranking for moisture, but yet our February, the last month out of the, uh, the winter, is going to end up as one of the driest on record. Um, so again, not contradiction. It's not nature trying to balance itself out. It's just the extremes and the weather whiplash, as Dr. Jennifer Francis has explained, going from one extreme to the other. And in New England, we do have a, a lot of uh, employment when it comes to winter activity. Maybe not as much in, in, in Cape Ann, but what happens not just locally, but regionally has an impact on our economy and our livelihoods as well. And if you look across uh, the state line into New Hampshire and Vermont, you're looking at uh, 12 to 24,000 jobs that rely on winter uh, tourism. And when you don't have the sustained cold and you don't have the sustained uh, snowpack, that's devastating for the ski industry, for uh, cross-country skiing trails, for uh, yeah, this, I know you don't make money off of, uh, but pond hockey, which I know a lot of people have played for generations in New England. These are experiences that we can no longer share with the younger generation. So not only is it heartbreaking, it's going to have a major impact on the economy. And this is just one small piece of what we have to worry about when it comes to a financial crisis brought on by the by the climate crisis. So a lot of conservatives uh, are worried about um, recession and depression, but yet when you factor in climate change into the equation, these are the real concerns that we have to worry about. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that uh, coming up. But Across the entire country, um, winter recreation makes up $12.2 billion across 38 states, including Massachusetts, uh, is, is pieced into that. And so is Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. And when you don't have as much snow, uh, that will just cripple this industry. The UP, the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, has no snow on the ground, and they typically average 300 inches over the course of the entire winter and they have bare ground. Places like Minneapolis and the surrounding communities have uh, closed ice skating rinks and other outdoor recreation because there hasn't been sustained cold. So this is something that we're seeing unfold locally, but we're also seeing it occur nationally, uh, which again is, is concerning. And then you look at the rising sea level component of the equation. And if you look at what occurs nat naturally without the human influence, Cape Ann, Essex County sees its fair share of coastal flooding with nor'easters, with extra tropical and tropical systems. But look at the uptick that we've seen with flood related events driven to sea level rise. And when you're that close to the water, inches matter. And what I think the common misconception is with, with people, uh, maybe that don't live along the coast, but people think that in New England, the biggest threat is a hurricane. But we have large fluctuations in, in tide cycles here. And for a hurricane to occur, normally is pretty rare because usually uh, the upper level pattern, weather pattern, steer storms out to sea, thankfully. Um, but if one were to come up the coast, like the 1938 hurricane, like Hurricane Carol, uh, these storms would have to coincide with an incoming or high tide. 
And typically the worst of the surge in a hurricane is confined to the area around the eye, especially the eastern part of the eye. So it's an even smaller area geographically. However, when you have these atmospheric rivers, like we're seeing during the winter, and we saw three times this uh, winter alone, we saw devastating coastal flooding that went from Maine all the way down to Maryland. So while the, the magnitude may not be as great as what you would see in a localized area during a hurricane, we are seeing these flood events that are far reaching and they are devastating for the people that are living at the coast and are dealing with this chronic flooding. But this is our new normal and flooding during the winter, I cannot emphasize this enough, is our biggest issue in New England, I would say, hands down. And that is something we need to watch now from the late fall into the early spring. Uh, and when you look at the numbers, it's it's concerning. Um, when you look at the, the total population uh, throughout the county that's below five feet, we're talking thousands of people. And while that sea level rise might not happen uh, in, the next 10, 20, 30 years, uh, a storm with five feet of sea level rise certainly is possible. And with climate change, we're seeing stronger storms. So maybe a nor'easter 20, 30 years ago wouldn't have caused the storm surge that we would see today, but that's what's concerning. Uh, a stronger storm with slightly higher sea levels, uh, even up by a foot, would cause significant flooding. And a large number uh, of the people listed on this map or the populations listed on here would experience flooding in a, in a hundred year event or a very, very strong nor'easter. <clears throat> and it comes with a high price tag as well. Um, by 2050, uh, there are hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property that are at risk. Uh, and that is, uh, now we're very close to being, let me do some quick math, that is within a 30-year mortgage. And I mention this story uh, frequently when, when I talk with uh, groups and it's impactful and I think shows uh, the bigger issue. And Maureen mentioned people wanting to know how they can get involved. And we'll go through a few of those examples, which are a little bit outside the box. And I, I try to be a little more um, uh, yeah, I try to be more outside the box than your traditional get solar, uh, drive EVs. I try to do uh, tangible things that we can all do. But I was covering a nor'easter for NBC Boston, and I won't say the town uh, because I don't want to give them a bad reputation, because everyone that runs a community uh, has to face this challenge at one time or another. But, you know, it, it costs money to keep a town going from paying teachers, firefighters, police officers, keeping the library open, uh, keeping the roads plowed. It comes with a price. And there was this this home that was right on the beach that was for sale during a nor'easter, uh, right before I left for Iowa. And the home was for sale and it had a price tag of about $1.5 million. And the listing said, your dream beach home, whether it's your permanent home or your vacation home, this three bedroom, three bathroom is your ideal you know, location, steps away from the beach. That house did not survive the nor'easter. <laughs> so for some reason, something in my head said, let me just take a screen grab of this, this property listing. And I, I don't know what, what told me to do that, but the storm didn't survive, uh, the house didn't survive that nor'easter, it was gone the next day. So I went back online, I refreshed the listing and the listing was changed to build your own dream beach home. <laughs> And there was uh, about a $250,000 price cut off that price. It was still a million and a quarter. But that's our problem right there. And if you look at that, the bigger picture, and when I said the financial crisis earlier, sure, the, the winter industry that we have across New England will suffer significantly. But our towns will too when homes that are already seeing repetitive losses, when they're not able to be rebuilt. And we really need to have that conversation should they be rebuilt? And I know that it's difficult to part ways with a home that is providing essentially tax revenue for this community. 
what is one less home that's valued at $1.5 million for the, for the tax roll? And, and these are the difficult conversations we need to, we need to be having. And with insurance companies moving out of the state, uh, with banks that are soon going to be saying, your house will be underwater by the end of the 30 year mortgage, we're not going to offer you any funding for this house. Uh, a lot of times conservatives, as I mentioned, worry about a financial crisis, but I can't really see a bigger crisis than that. When you look at how many people live along the coastline in Massachusetts, in New England, along the East Coast, along all the coasts in the United States, it's overwhelming to think about. And it is something that keeps climate scientists up at night. So I, I want plenty of time for, for Q&A. And I, I mentioned I'd stop by 7.35 and we're, we're almost there. But here are some of those individual actions that I think people can take. And I've tried to curate this list over time um, instead of just making it filled with throwaways. In my new role in environmental consulting, I've noticed that there aren't a lot of people that attend public meetings. Public meetings where a lot of these mitigation and adaptation projects are being discussed, are being voted on where the conceptual designs are being shared with the community for feedback and no one is there. Go to these meetings, listen to what these leaders have to say, uh, find out about maybe the co-benefits of nature-based solutions and, and, and the positives that they'll bring to the community, right? There's an even bigger return on investment if you can uh, not put up a seawall, but maybe put in um, some kind of uh, cobbled berm or, or other natural protection. There could be some, some benefits to the overall community. So again, I encourage you to go to meetings, vote for candidates that take climate change seriously. That isn't necessarily a Democrat. Uh, there are plenty of conservative um, politicians, especially in parts of the country where climate change is very visible, like in Florida, who understand that climate action is important. And then talking about it, talking about it, going to talks like this, getting involved in community groups. I said this um, uh, to a talk uh, last night that I gave that, you know, my, my dad, um, uh, is in his mid seventies. Has been dealing with with bad health. We went on a, a family trip uh, to Greece, and and he took the time to learn from locals about the impacts on climate change and olive production after a devastating drought and fires that affected them, and and the yield of uh, olives being way down because of the drought and fires. That's the conversation we all need to be having, and every profession that is listening and represented tonight will be impacted by climate change one way or another. And I cannot, again, under, under sell the importance of that because if you're in public works, if you're a teacher, if you're in the healthcare profession, climate change is everywhere and it's affecting everyone and it's affecting everything we do. So with that, I want to open it up for, for questions. Um, I'll do the... Stop share so I can see everyone. <clears throat> Great, thanks so much, thanks Chris. So much. Um, hope I'm not having too much of a um, reverb here. Um, we are going to do Q and A with Chris right now. Uh, a few items uh, to note about Q and A. You can put your questions in the chat. There are already some in there from Renee, uh, which I'll get to Renee. And you can also raise your hand if you would like to speak or ask Chris a question. Um, to start with, uh, you know, I wanted to ask a question from um, some folks who actually uh, sent their questions in mm -hmm. earlier. Um, we had a question from a mother who's uh, who of three three boys, and she she's talking to her children about uh, climate change and the lack of snow. Um, what do you say to her, Chris, um, about what's happening or how to speak to children about this change when they love snow so much? And then how also could they get involved, especially with the winter situation that we're experiencing this year? I think it's, I think it's a great question. I think, first of all, don't move to Florida where they're taking climate change out of all, uh, <laughs> all curriculums um step one but step two is encouraging teachers to talk about it and i actually talked with somebody earlier today 
did had a had an interview with somebody about just that. It shouldn't just be one class. It should be every class talking about the impacts of climate change and encouraging teachers to do that. A health teacher talking about how respiratory conditions will happen with burning wildfires across parts of the, the West in Canada and how that's affecting public health and how urban heat islands affect minority communities more. Um, to history lessons, perhaps that Boston was was built uh, on, on backfilled land. And for years, it's been fine because everything was based on a stable or what we thought was a stable environment, stable climate. So that's how infrastructure projects are designed. But now we're seeing these hundred and a thousand year events happening with regularity and we can no longer uh, believe and think and plan for a stable climate because it's anything but stable. So it's asking teachers in all settings to talk about climate change and, and, and incorporate it into their lectures. Uh, it's also asking a meteorologist at a local TV station. Boston is great with it, with showing up at schools and writing in to a local um, TV meteorologist saying, I want somebody to talk about climate change to my son or daughter's class. Have the teacher reach out. That's another way that you can get the conversation going. There are a lot of meteorologists who are well-versed in climate change in this market. That's a great question, so thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, if you want to raise your hand using the prompt uh, down below in your Zoom, um, you can do that. But Chris, I have another question for you that came mm -hmm. from folks um, as they registered. Uh, biodiversity loss in the face of these warming winters, what are we looking at? You know, what what should we expect and what what is that loss going you know, to be like? I mean, biodiversity loss is already significant. And the fact that we're seeing shifts of uh, some of our... Um, cash commodities when it comes to, I guess you could call it that, cod and lobster and uh, shellfish are being affected as well with these warmer ocean water temperatures. So we're already seeing that. But I think it, almost a, a, a bigger concern is the, the increased biodiversity of invasive species and, and new um, plants uh, and animals that are coming to our region that are, are non-native and what that will do to native species. Uh, mile a minute is an ex excellent example. Thrives on CO2, which of course is increasing, and it's overtaking all kinds of, of vegetation that's native to the area. Um, and, and we're seeing it with other bird species as well. Birds that are native to the area are being pushed out by birds that are now finding this uh, a welcoming climate. Uh, so I think it's it's twofold. I think it's we're seeing loss in biodiversity when it comes to uh, many native species, but then we're introducing new species that don't really coexist with with what we have locally. Thanks for that. I think it's something that we just have to keep watching, um, yeah. and and also recording. I mean, there's you know the Christmas bird watch. I know the the, the local paper has bird sightings, but. You know, we we need to keep an eye on, you know, what we don't see any longer so that we don't miss it, because what's invisible might not necessarily we might not necessarily think about it anymore. Um, and actually, to build on that quickly, Thoreau with um, Walden Pond, if you're familiar with that, uh, I think it's that uh, there's a professor. Um, maybe it's it's Walden. If you if you look up online, Walden Pond and warming, it's a fascinating look at at, at what Maureen just mentioned. Especially, uh, you know, what species are around? What have we lost? What have we introduced? When things come into bloom, uh, how much earlier have they come uh, into bloom? And essentially, it's his class that that took over some of those observations from Thoreau, and and built on that. Uh, so I, I highly recommend that if you if you want to do some reading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get we'll get to that. Um, one question from Renee in the chat. I'll try to get it to as many as possible. Mm -hmm. She's asking about the AMOC. Could you explain what the AMOC is? There's a lot of of uh, you know conversation about this now because of that new study. 
Yeah. Um, so the AMOC is one of Earth's major uh, engines, and it, uh, ocean currents typically are driven by temperature differential, uh, but also water density, uh, fresh water and salt water. And when you have melting glaciers, um, when you have melting glaciers that are flowing into the oceans, the density is out of whack. And you have fresh water that is extending much farther equatorward. And so you're seeing a slowing because of less of a temperature differential, but also the density imbalance uh, that's occurring with that freshwater intrusion. And the AMOC is why there's uh, a survivable climate in places like the United Kingdom, in Ireland, in Northern Europe. In those areas, if there's even a slowing, uh, wheat production could drop by half, uh, and temperatures could go down by 7 to 12 degrees. And remember, we're not talking about uh, a day going from 50 down to 50, uh, 50 down to 45. We're talking about the low of the average of the area. And that's what's concerning. So this is a the engine that essentially is slowing down. And it is something that we should be extremely concerned about, because even if it doesn't just stop, a slowing, which we've already seen some signs of it, would be catastrophic. Well, we'll have some more coming on that from Town Green uh, for sure, but thanks for that overview, Chris. Uh, one question in the chat, how, how symmetric are the climate effects? For instance, will we see extreme hot days in the summer to the same extent that we are seeing them now in the winter? Well, winter's warming at a, at, a, at a greater pace. So when you have a lower starting off point, it's a lot easier to warm that than than uh, summertime temperatures. And also when you have a higher moisture content in the air with high humidity, it's actually harder to heat that up. Um, and sometimes the, the impacts aren't felt across the area, uh, across the United States equally. Um, uh, we talk a lot about how in environmental justice communities are hit harder, but there are geographic areas that are not as vulnerable as places along the coastline. And that was one of the things I encountered in Iowa is the impacts were not as visual as driving down Morrissey Boulevard uh, in Boston on a sunny day and there's a foot and a half of water. Um, sure, there's drought. Sure, there's heat and it feels warmer. But if there's 10 more days that are above average, what does that feel like? What does that look like? So I think that it is it's disproportionate and there are areas that are hit harder and winter is seeing the greatest change, especially locally. Hmm. Well, this winter has been a bust for us. I mean, yeah. I just talk about heartbreaking. I'm, I'm heartbroken over no snow, um, no pond, no pond hockey. Um, another question from the chat, um, to what degree, if any, has the state taken uh, the effects of climate change on the communities that are being forced to change zoning to accommodate more housing. Cape Ann is certainly one of them. I guess, you know, I guess this is a, a climate change and zoning uh, question uh, that what the state is looking. I'm not sure if you can answer that or address that. I mean, I can because I was part of this project and I'm, I'm working on the project as one of the consultants on the team. Uh, but that kind of goes to what Resilient Coasts is going to be. And that's something that the governor uh, recently announced, which is exciting and very progressive work. And I think there could be some tough decisions and in, in where we build, who can build where, and, uh, you know, maybe managed retreat comes into the equation. But the fact that the administration is being as progressive as they are um, makes me optimistic because at the end of the day, there's going to be this pot of funds that's, there for managed retreat and people to move on and over 100 million people right that live pretty close to the coastline that may suffer a similar fate it's better to make these decisions now and take action sooner than later um so i think that the current administration is doing a, a just a fabulous job uh with uh with their their climate action um, but yeah, I mean, that's, I think that piggybacks off my story about the home that was listed for sale. They allowed a new house to go up. 
And and to finish that story, there is a, a, a brand new three bedroom house that <laughs> was on that plot of land that washed away only a few years ago. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, could happen here. Yeah, absolutely. I um, wanted to just mention to everyone that uh, just a, to, regarding Resilient Coast and the state, uh, Town Green is bringing Melissa Hoffer to Cape Ann. Uh, it'll be in May, probably May 28th or 29th. I'm not sure yet. I'm still trying to find a venue for that. Um, but she will be, she's the climate chief for Massachusetts. And so she'll be in person um, speaking to Cape Ann. So um, we'll learn more about it uh, there. And um, uh, another conver another question from the chat on actions we can take aside from the actions you mentioned, where do you see community actions around electrifying homes and transport fitting? I mean, we're talking about a little something different here, but um, we can't wait for the perfect policies to be enacted to encourage change. I know you said earlier you're, you're you know, you're for electrification and so forth, but you're also looking oh, yeah. at change. But when the price point of an electric car is still forty thousand dollars, how attainable is that for a lot of people? Uh, my parents went solar just because they were environmental stewards. They're on social security, um, had the money uh, and savings to allow them to do it, but they got none of the, the rebates or tax incentives because of it. They did it just to be um, environmentalists. That's what needs to change, needs to be equitable, our electrification process. Uh, on the panel that I was on last night for uh, Green Pro Bono, um, there was a, a woman who is working with nonprofits to make sure that it's an equitable and just transition, which is exciting by restoring electric vehicles for lower income environmental justice communities that allow them to electrify their, their vehicles and their homes, which is very exciting. But I think that we really need to do that. And what, what's shocking is in World War II, we essentially retooled everything to fight a huge war uh, across Europe. And uh, that's the, the, the shift that we need to happen. Everything needs to shift towards this. And, and we really need to, to have that happen sooner than later. Uh, while, you know, uh, the Biden administration passed the Inflation Reduction Act, I, I think it's been disappointing and discouraging. There's been more oil production under, uh, under President Biden than there's been under any president uh, in, in recorded history. Um, so we need more change than, than the change we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, a question about climate communication or climate science communication. And I think because you're a, a communicator and you have been for all of your career, um, what are your thoughts? So this is coming from the chat. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts about, um, you know, dealing with, I guess, climate deniers, um, especially when there's so so much climate impact happening like we talked earlier before uh, we came on the air about um, what's happening in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, do you see any hope or progress there? I mean, as a there's always going to be a percentage of Americans who deny climate change. I mean, that's showed by the Yale uh, yep. survey that they do every year of the six Americas, but um, what, what do you think as a climate communication specialist? Uh, piggybacking off of what you said, Maureen, there's really that 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 the Yale program on climate change communication has found that only 10 percent of people are dismissive. That 10 percent you might as well just not engage with. These are people that uh, not to get political, but I think there's more of a psychological issue than truly believing it. Uh, but in 2016, uh, the belief that an election was stolen to go against all science and facts and data and say that no my ideology is telling me otherwise those people are, are are not reachable but even the people that are cautious you can still engage with and i was successful at doing that and finding terms like fiscally responsible energy independence to kind of bridge that gap and reach across the aisle was extremely effective. So I'm going to put my LinkedIn here too and, and my email. If you have any questions, I'm always open to, to talk and discuss. And if people want to ask questions or ideas, I know it's 10 to 
feel free to, to reach out, but. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, there are, I mean, there's so many questions about how we will be affected. Um, and as our winters warm, I mean, last year we had a snow drought, uh, this year we're having a snow drought. Um, and it just remains to be seen also like an early spring, I'm seeing flowers coming up in my garden. Um, you know, I'm worried about the insects and the birds and how th those things happen. Um, I just think we have to, uh, you know, keep, keep an eye on that. Um, and there's not much we can do about it, right? No, I mean, it, while individual action is important, the steps that I gave you lead to collective action because showing up and voting are things that eventually will turn the tide in at levels of government that make it can make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what it's going to take because individual action can go so far before we see that monumental shift that we do need. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, I, I do think that, you know, local action, local engagement, um, for sure, you know, policy has been often uh, touted as the way to make change. Um, but people, people want to know how to get involved. And I think that, you know, come learning more, uh, attending our uh, town green mm -hmm. programs, you really can that start the action, there's other ways that you can, you can get involved. Um, and, and one of them uh, is a field trip that's coming up. And I thought that you know, Chris and I would talk about a field trip that Chris helped to set up. I'm going to share my screen for a moment so you can just see. I guess I can't share my screen. Um, anyway, well, I, I'm not able to share my screen, unfortunately, but I can tell you a little bit more about this field trip coming up on March 8th. It's uh, climate adaptation on Argilla Road um, or Argilla Road uh, <laughs> um, in Ipswich, uh, part of the greater Cape Ann region. And Chris helped to put us in touch with the trustees over there. Uh, it's going to be March 8th from three to four and we'll be meeting right at the estate. More information will be sent out in uh, the Town Green newsletter. But Chris, could you talk about why you thought that this particular uh, field trip with Russ Hopping would be a good idea to connect with this um, this topic and webinar? Uh, Russ is uh, a visionary and effective communicator. I interviewed him for the Great Salt Marsh at the trustees' property up uh, up on the North Shore. Um, I guess you could call it the North Shore. Uh, the property up there, their salt marsh restoration, and salt marshes help absorb like coral reefs, the, the blow of battering waves that you have with big storms. And the ditches that we dug uh, for decades destroyed the overall marsh health. And they found creative ways to fill those, those channels and restore the health of the marshes. And that is what we call a, a nature-based solution. And he is one of the experts that I turn to when it comes to these nature-based solutions. And this project site has a lot of uh, adaptations that are being considered for this, this one area. And I think when we, we talk about um, increasing the size of culverts and um, using uh, other green ways to, to work on climate solutions, it's hard to visualize. So this is, I think, an opportunity for people to understand what nature-based climate solutions will look like and in a community not too far away. Right. And the Woods Hole Group you're working with, yeah. the Woods Hole Group is working with the trustees. And so, um, again, more information on this great field trip coming up, which is, uh, I guess, next Friday, uh, March 8th from 3 to 4 p.m. And we'll be meeting at the Crane Estate to uh, walk with Russ Hopping, who is the trustee's lead coastal ecologist. We'll be looking at the marsh. Um, we've had a couple of marsh uh, field trips already, and um, this is going to be another great one um, close by in Ipswich. Uh, I know that folks are asking lots of questions that uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily think that you could answer, but you know, you're amazing. You could answer anything. But I will say to the folks who want more information about Long Beach is that we will have 
another conversation with um, a climate scientist that would take a look at uh, managed retreat and also the language around managed retreat. Managed retreat is very scary sounding, but there's lots of different ways to approach it. And there's a lot of policy that can be put into place to address it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the scary thing that it sounds like. Um, so Town Green's working on that. We'll have a program um, coming up in the future. Um, and so we've just got so much. And Chris, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure to listen to you and to hear you talk about this major issue about warming New England winters. Um, I want to thank you so much. Um, course, and uh, I also want to thank um, the folks from Town Green who make this possible, uh, especially Tom Mikus, who's our tech advisor, and to Common Crow, our sponsor, our lead sponsor for our programs. Um, please connect with us on social, uh, sign up for our newsletter for more information to find out when our next programs are, look at our calendar. But um, for everyone here on behalf of Town Green, I'm going to say good night and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.